Now here's an example. Now, now you see, I could just... This, this is something that I've dealt with in uh, Man Who Jake, where you get uh, a futuristic apartment building, and I got this idea of reading about uh, People's China. You get all, of, uh, all the people living in your building, and you all get together every, every three days. And everybody in the building tells you what's right and what's wrong, and they, you, know, you get up and you confess your shortcomings. And this is now called attack therapy. And I went through attack therapy in Canada, at a uh, drug rehab place I was at, although I wasn't there for drug rehabilitation. Hey, dickheads! Like a pink laser beam of truth breathing straight from San Diego, California to your brain hole! We are your personal dickheads. I don't know if any of us has Donald Trump's statue's head in our closet. <laughs> but... <laughs> but find out at the end of this podcast where we're breaming straight for your brain. <laughs> breaming? Do you want me to start over? No. No, okay. God well, no. hey, uh, we may have japed a statue of Donald Trump, but maybe not. We just lost all our alt-right listeners. Someone's yeah. going to write an angry tweet or email to me or David saying, I don't really appreciate you making this podcast political. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a podcast about Philip K. Dick, not political. That would be an interesting... Yeah, keep it to the, the space pollen. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, definitely not this episode. It's, it's going to get political. All right, so... I am David Agronoff, author of Pug Rock Ghost Story and the Vegan Revolution with Zombies. With and, me is... Oh, I'm Anthony Trevino. Uh, I'm the author of the horror comic Fruition, King Space Void, a really cool book no one will ever read, and a bunch of other short stories and shit we've read no it. one cares about. That's true. You guys have read it. Yeah, we've read King Space Void. It's good. And who's my man over there engineering this? Hi, I'm Langhorn J. Lang <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. He didn't even say it right that I'm, time. I'm Lang Hang. Lang Hang. Lang <laughs> Langhorn. I am Langhorn J. Tweed. So wait, I have a question, Larry. Am, am I not supposed to be using your real name on this podcast? Because <laughs> he just did. I honest, oh, honestly don't care. Okay, just check. Okay. We don't have a ton going on, except for I did just release... My newest novel, Ring of Fire. Yeah, that's pretty big. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. big. Uh, it was a big deal for me, but you guys both helped me on the book, so I think it. I think we're all pretty excited about the book coming out. Yeah. But, uh, Ring of Fire, if any of you listeners are interested, it's a cli-fi, climate change, end of the world, apocalypse novel. Is um, cli-fi a thing? Cli-fi is... That's is an actual term in genre fiction? Yes, cli-fi oh. is a new thing. Uh, climate weird. change fiction. Yeah, there's a, actually... There's a website devoted to it, and I'm writing an article for the Cli-Fi website. Oh, that's cool. Next week. So does that mean eventually there's going to be Wi-Fi genre fiction that's all about the horror of the internet? Like Unfriended? Yeah, or Friend Request. And yeah. So. Sa sadly, you guys, I have to tell you, Friend Request, kind of an enjoyable movie. Well, I, I've heard good things about Unfriended, too, but I don't know. If Not that... a good movie. Okay. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Well, anyways, yes, Cli-Fi is a thing, and there, actually, you know, a couple months ago, I, or a month or two ago, I reviewed a, a Cli-Fi novel, and this website picked up my review and reposted it, and it's the most hits I've, I've gotten on my blog for review ever. Awesome, so. dude. Congratulations, Great. David. Well, Cli-Fi is a big thing, so yeah, Ring of Fire, it's from Deadite <laughs> Press, and available on Amazon now for purchase, so if anybody's interested in getting it, later in the year I have a very uh, a more PKD-style novel coming out, but we'll talk about that when we get closer to that. I don't. <laughs> Not that you're bitter or anything. No, it's fine. Whatever. Wait, yes you do. Yes you do. You yeah, have... we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how that plays out. Okay, so Anthony did write a very good novella that is very PKD influenced that both Larry and I have read. It's very good. Surprisingly, yeah. Um, I'll bring it up right now. the The book we're doing today, the man who japed, actually was kind of an inspiration for that book a little bit. Uh, for sure. All right, so we start off with PKD news, which is n there's never like a ton of that since he has he left gone. us. In one piece of PKD news, I think that I want to point our listeners to is there's a really cool podcast from NPR called Imaginary Worlds, 
It's like a whole podcast devoted to fictional, fantastical worlds. And they just did an episode recently on Philip K. Dick. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's a good episode. And I think one of our listeners, Victoria Stewart from Minneapolis, who's a playwright who wrote a play called 800 Words, The Transmigration of Philip K. Dick, she's interviewed for it. And we want to have Victoria on the podcast to talk about her play sometime soon as a bonus episode. So, yeah, that's a really cool podcast, Imaginary Worlds. Even when they're not talking about Philip K. Dick, they did a three-parter on Doctor Who that was really cool. Anthony would have loved it because he's a huge Doctor Who fan. Yeah, great. <laughs> I'm just regular Whovian over here. Where's Where'd I park my TARDIS? That is that what it's called? Is that yeah, that you got that right. Yeah. yeah, Larry and I, on the other hand, are... Whovians, but whatever. Anyways, so... I did like David Tennant. David Tennant is my favorite Doctor, but not that this is a Doctor Who podcast, so... I'm, yet. Yet. So, our next segment is Dick Like Suggestions. Does anybody else want to start off, or should I? I think you better go first, David, because yeah, you, you, you are the most prepared person on this podcast. <laughs> So, uh, my pick is The Warren by Brian Evanson. Great novella. Yeah, yeah, it is really good. It's a hundred pager from Tor Books, from their, no their like, horror sci-fi novella series, which has released a bunch of really cool books, like Victor Laval's Ballad of Black Tom was in that series. The Binti series by Nadia Okafor is really good. But for PKD style, The Warren by Brian Evanson, he is just a fantastic writer who we both are... Brian's an awesome guy. His collection of short stories, A Collapse of Horses, is brilliant. I would say he, along with probably Cody Goodfellow, is my second favorite working writer today. Evanson is the shit. And the so what, what is the novella about? <laughs> yeah, that's... Well, it's kind of... It's kind of trippy. It's it's about well, how does it? It's um how is it uh like PKD like? Yeah. Well, there's definitely a what is reality to it. Oh, um, okay. There's a character who's on a spaceship that's well, it's, 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 it, he's it's crashed on a planet. It's, it's been a little while since we've yeah. read it. Are, are they going to a colony? <laughs> no, not at the end. Basically, it's about a guy who wakes up and he's trying to figure out who he is and where he is and what he's supposed to do, and you don't really know throughout the, like, 90 or so pages of whether or not he is even human. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it's fucking great. It's really good. I read it on a plane in one sitting, and if you have the ability to sit down and read it all in one sitting, it's definitely. One of the, it's one of the few books I've gone out and bought for people who I feel would really enjoy it. It's fucking good. And he actually premiered the book at our the, our film festival in, in San Diego, the uh, Horrible Imaginings. He, so, well, it's not our film festival. Well, we... Well, it's San Diego's. Yeah, San Diego, ours. Uh, well, it was. It's not in San Diego anymore. But uh, we, we did book Brian Evan Evanson to speak at the festival because we used to do the literature at the event. And he premiered the book at HIF. So we really believe in that book. So... I don't have a whole lot of... I mean, the last movie that I saw that was science fiction was Upgrade. It's not very PKD-like. It's more Paul Verhoeven's RoboCop-like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, it was all right. It was all Larry, right. Well, Larry liked it. Larry, I, you I enjoyed it Upgrade? thoroughly, especially the end. Yeah. I, I enjoyed the end, but I don't know. The whole third act felt pretty rushed. Well, and another thing, uh, I know I mentioned it in my first dick-like suggestions, but I did finally finish The City in the City, the China Mieville, mm -hmm. and that's uh, the BBC miniseries. Very good. Very Sweet. Good. So there's some dick-like suggestions for you. What about what about me? Larry, do you have one? I do. What's um, your dick-like suggestion? There's a new video game out called Detroit Being Human. Oh, I heard about that game. By uh, David Cage, hmm. the the crazy video game maker who who made Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls. And it is basically a do Android stream, but in video game form. You huh. follow three separate androids as they, in different ways, discover their humanity. And it takes place in Detroit? Yes. So does it have a little RoboCop to it, too? It, well... In places, I just <laughs> you think can say Detroit, that. I think RoboCop. Right. But it's set far in the future. 
Did you ever? Did any of you guys see that Fox show, Almost Human, that was on for a year? That was... No, it it didn't look like something I would really enjoy. It had a little bit of PKD in it, little little tiny bit. But uh... there is an android cop in the game. Yeah, who searches for other androids who are malfunctioning. So if you want to, I mean, that's kind of on the nose. It's very on the nose, but <laughs> I mean, if you couldn't get the rights to do a PKD video game, which would be really cool, but you know, yeah, that sounds cool. Um, I'm not a video gamer, but that sounds really interesting. Well, hopefully some of our listeners are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. That's a good dick like suggestion. Well done, Larry. Thank you. Larry, you were very well prepared. I'm like, oh, he means me. Yeah. yeah. I didn't have any dick-like suggestions. I didn't watch or read anything that was that was pertinent to this podcast, Dad. All right. Well, you know, you could have pulled one out from the past, you know. <laughs> Anthony's have. here to make us look pretty. All right. Anyways. Fuck you, Larry. <laughs> on to The Man Who Japed. So, Man Who Japed was released in 1956. David. What Larry. was happening in 1956? In 1956. Oh, I got you. Well, this was the same year as our last book was published, so I'm going to have to recycle some of the things that happened in that year. Oh, uh, don't don't repeat it. Well, I just think you it, don't have anything new from 1956. Now, who's not prepared? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, yeah. I do think it's important to point out that this was the year of of Elvis Presley's first hit. Because I just think that that's a really good time marker for how far back this was. For our journey into Morex society. Right. Do you think Elvis would have just sent the Morex society <laughs> crumbling to its knees? With his, with with his, his hips? hips. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that, that could be. And see, here's the funny thing is, is that when you're talking about a lot of the themes of this book, when you look at what time it was in, in history, it's just amazing to believe that he was addressing a lot of these issues when, like, TVs were not ubiquitous and, and you know, radio was still a thing. Much more of a thing. I guess radio is still a thing. But, yeah. 19- well, and television, advertising, you know, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and this book is much – I mean, the other two books that we've read so far of – Dicks were political for sure, but this is definitely. I think you might be hard pressed to find a a book by Dick that isn't. Yeah, he's very just a very. Well, there's political... a couple out there. Yeah, there's just a little a lot of political thinking there, and um, but but the man who japed, or was... as I've subtitled it, post-apocalyptic madmen. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, right. Who's the Pete Campbell of this? <laughs> that guy sucked. Yeah, that guy's on. Um, it would the... be Luddy probably. The guy who played Pete Campbell's on The Path, the, the Hulu show, like, the, in the third season. And it's weird seeing him with a beard. He has a beard in it. Ugh, really? Yeah. All right, anyways, this is not the Mad Men podcast. But the pu- yeah. let's, let's talk about the publishing history of The Man Who Japed. So this book, uh, surprisingly, was published by Ace Books. Or what? not Not surprisingly. <laughs> not surprisingly, as almost all of PKD's books were published by Ace Books. And as he said himself, Ace saved his life. Yes. Yeah, they were really, I think he said, really good to him. Yeah, this was half of Ace Double number 193, and it was do si with The Space Born by E.C. Tubb. I've never heard of E.C. Tubb, <laughs> but I have a little description here of Space Born. Yeah, Space Born. Far from Earth on a ship carrying the 13th and 14th generations of descendants from the original crew, life is short. You are born, learn the tasks needed to keep the ship running, help breed and train the next crew, and your death is ordered by the computer in charge. Grigson, chief of the psych police, makes sure that the computer's death sentences are carried out quickly and painlessly. His duty is a sacred trust. He knows the intricacies of the system, how it works, and how it can be subverted. He is growing old, rebellious, He also knows his name will soon come up in the computer for elimination, and he has no intention of carrying out his own death sentence. Yeah, I want to read that. (laughs) I want to read every book about shitty, mean-spirited computers. (laughs) It also also sounds a little like Looper, the story from Looper. Yeah, I thought... A little bit. There's There's no, like, you know, mean computer. Now, that sounds very, uh, PK... There's a mean little kid. I like the... Oh, yeah, that kid sucks. The, there's <laughs> psych police and, and the, 
It's a generation ship with an angry computer. I, I'm down yeah, for this one. It's a yeah. thriller. I think I might read this in between. That's kind of cool. And it would have been an interesting do si do with the man who jaded. It- and um, my my homeboy, uh, Robert Garfat, who owned a um, science fiction used bookstore in Victoria, Canada, big, huge dickhead himself. He had almost all the ace doubles. Like he had a big wow. shelf, like full of them. So when I saw the number that it was D one ninety three, that wasn't that crazy to me because I think he had probably two hundred ace doubles in his bookstore. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Robert's really cool. I've been Robert. If you're listening, you know I want to have you on the show. He was a bookseller for a long time. Huge Philip K. Dick fan, and he's the guy who got me into Norman Spinrad. Nice. So. Uh, kind of got me. Actually, no, that's not true. Cody Goodfellow first suggested Norman Spinrad to me, but Robert sold me a bunch of Spinrad books. Speaking of Roberts, who are booksellers, we definitely got to have our friend Rob from, uh, from Mysterious Mr. Galaxy on here. Yeah, 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 that would be great. Yeah, maybe he'll want to do Cosmic Puppets with us. Hey, I'll ask him. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, more uh, meeting about the show during the show. Uh... <laughs> All right, so the man who japed is, <coughs> is set in the year 2114. And so apparently, I'm not familiar with this book, but Dick was working on a book called Mary and the Giant. I think that's one of his non-sci-fi mm-hmm. attempts at hard literature. So he so was re- this when he, it, yeah. the period when he was attempting to be a legitimate, as quote-unquote, well, legitimate think, author? Yeah, think, someone who wasn't a genre writer? Yeah, yeah, he was doing that all the time. And that then, distinction bugs me, by the way. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but when people but, put yeah. that kind of arbitrary label on it, of this is literature, not your peddling genre fiction. It right. drives me fucking insane. Yeah. I wrote a but, story with a character that, but that was being, the villain that constantly mm-hmm. mentioned that he but, was literature and not genre. But I like genre. The, the idea of Dick's more literary book being called Mary and the Giant. Yeah. yeah right. Come on. <laughs> well, Humpty Dumpty in Oakland, and he did a couple that you will we'll, we'll eventually read those. Gather Yourselves Together is one of his non-sci-fi ones. But, um, so The Man Who Japed, he wrote in the summer of 1955, and the manuscript, uh, he turned it into his agency in October, and he did a revision for Ace Books, after that, so he did probably like three drafts. And one thing that's really interesting about The Man Who Japed is that it is the first Philip K. Dick novel published with the title that he gave it. Yeah. Nice. It's, yeah, it's one of the few ones that has the title that he gave it because Don Wolheim, his editor at Ace, loved to retitle his books. Um, often for good reason. Often for good reason. But it, didn't this one also get trimmed? To fit yeah, into the Ace Yeah, he took double. about, I think he said, 75 pages out of it. Right. I think I have a quote coming up about that. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, this next quote. Yeah, so I have a quote <laughs> from Philip K. Dick about that. In my own opinion, The Man Who Japed is a far better book than any of the others. I had to cut 75 TypeScript pages from it to fit the Ace Double Edition. But I would be the last to complain about Ace since they've kept me alive these several years. On a personal level, level, Don Wolheim has given me extraordinary encouragement and attention, as you well know. Anyways, so yeah, he cut 75 pages from it. And I think it's, like, I don't think I would have enjoyed it to be much longer. um, Yeah. Really. I was fine with the length, and, and so I'm sure that 75 pages probably was a good thing to come out. And I don't really think the story hurt for it. I don't feel like we're missing anything. Did, did you guys feel like... No, I, maybe more time with the psychiatrist or something along those lines, but it really didn't feel like it was missing anything. No, I, I think I, they're pretty lean compared to Jones or... Um, solar Lottery. Or Solar Lottery, yeah. Yeah. And we're definitely dealing with the aftermath of the reviews of Solar Lottery still at this time because when he wrote Japes, Solar Lottery was his only released book at the time. Like Mm -hmm. he he wrote it really close to, you know, World Jones Made had not quite come out yet. So he was still kind of under the shadow of the uh, how Solar Lottery kept being called like a leftist book. And that kind of annoyed him. So in this quote, he talks about from a letter that he wrote to the science fiction writer James Blish. 
He said, as I, I'll take it from here, David. Okay. <clears throat> as to Japed, I have to, in all fairness, say this. The topic is not American culture, but the society coming into existence in mainland China. The puritanical left society, with its emphasis on confession, fear, guilt, omphalos, which is the critical concept, the idea of sinner, in really authoritative CP writings, you get this again and again. Sinner says, it's the policy at sinner. This is the nature of totalitarianism. This facing toward the sinner, the hub. You see, I wanted to show that as dreadful as commercial bourgeois U.S. culture could be... Bourgeois. Bourgeois. Culture could be... Thanks, Prof. There are things that pose a greater danger. Go further in destroying the integrity of the individual. Block committees are worse than TV. And... I was motivated by the acclaim in some circles toward my first book, Solar Lottery. They seemed to feel that I was bitterly attacking Democrat society, that I was taking an extreme left position. They saw more in my book than I meant, and I wanted to take the other side then and have a go at the left. And by golly, those same reviewers denounced Jape. Evidently, they grasped that I was getting at their sacred cow. <laughs> I like that. I like that last bit. Yeah, and, and it's really, that's where, once I read that quote and saw that he was kind of interpreting the, like, communist revolution in, in China, it really changed, I think I read that quote when I was about halfway through the book, it really changed how I kind of viewed the text and mm-hmm. saw, like, the, the more wreck and stuff like that under a very different eye, kind of saw it as kind of a Maoist thing. Right. And I didn't see that at first, so that definitely... Really? Yeah, well, I just didn't. I don't, I don't. I'm not. I was not aware of that while I was reading it, and of course, I wasn't thinking of communist China. Mm-hmm. But the I think the theme comes through whether you are whether you're there in in the time that he wrote it and all this stuff was happening, mm-hmm. or you, if you read it now, you can still see how you know it, it, this is obviously transferred to a Western society. Yeah, where they've taken basically religious control and made a totalitarian totalitarian government out of it where the only marketing that's allowed is for the state. Mm -hmm. I I think that's, that's clear whether you, whether you know about China or not. Well, and it's interesting too, because China was just recently going through this at the time, you know? So this was like a new and fresh thing. That would be kind of like about like us writing about the Trump presidency right now. You know, as it was kind of happening. Yeah. And so for us to look back on it is, it's kind of interesting, but I think there's a lot to learn. You know, we always talk about like kind of writing tips that we learn from, from reading these PKD books. I think one thing that you can learn just from that quote and from looking at man who japed in total is that not writing your political message so on the nose because right. I think there's a lot to interpret. And I think what's cool is that. PKD was saying, like, you know, if I'm doing my job right as a writer, they're, they're going to take different views. They're going to sometimes think I'm super right wing. They're going to think I'm left wing. They're going to think all these different things about what I'm saying because the story comes first. Well, I think that there's, that's Dick being tactful in his world building and taking care to get his point across without bludgeoning you in the face with it like those goddamn purge movies do <laughs> which is just continuously getting hit in the shovel hit in the face with a shovel for 90 yeah, minutes right. do you get it do you get it do you get it right you know yeah and i think that if, if if there's one thing that i really take away from from the man who japed as far as like you know writing lessons i, th- I think that, that that not being on the nose with the political stuff is 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 the way to go well i've uh, can i yeah you talk may. about talk about the word jape for sure. a second yeah Please. So, jape is a word that means basically performing a practical joke or getting something over someone where they don't know what you did. And the origin of the word comes from Chaucer era, Mm -hmm. so 1400s, something along those lines. And it was very popular for a short time, but then it stopped being a popular word when it took on a different connotation. And they started using it to refer to sex. Hmm. And well, so the, the word fell out of popularity for a long time and came back in, in the 19th century a little bit. But in the 20th century, pulp writers and science fiction writers used it quite a bit in the 40s and 50s. 
So it's actually um, defined in the book here. There's a scene between when Purcell's talking to his wife, Janet, and he's talking about the incident with the head coming off the statue. And he says, I japed it. He said aloud, you. And then he says, a term used in packet assembly. When a theme is harped on too much, you get parody. When, uh, when we make fun of a stale theme, we say we've japed it. So. Right, but that's not... The actual definition. That's the definition that's is, the one is the a book. joke, yeah, or or a practical joke, right? And I get what you're saying, but what, but I'm I'm just trying to bring it back to to what was said in the book. You know what I mean? Sure. We know you mean, David. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and I. But think, remember, what makes him different different is he has a sense of humor. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that scene, but I think it's interesting the history of the term japed because when I when every first time we talked about the book, every time we'd say the man who japed, I was like, "What the hell is he talking about?" or "What's that about?" <laughs> I had no idea. Right. And I purposely didn't look it up or anything, and I just kind of waited for the book to explain it to me. And um, I was only familiar with the word because in the movie The Imposters, uh, Billy Connolly uses it when he's talking about joking around. All right, so I got two more Philip K. Dick quotes about the book before we get more hardcore into the story. He did also say, Anyone who understands the man who japed would never make the error of thinking I was a communist or a Marxist because this is a very, very sincere attempt to show the very dangerous trends in communism and the communist state. So he was Interesting. Yeah, he was definitely trying to to make a point about that. And it's funny because when we get into it, just remember that quote we'll, we'll, we talk more directly about the book because it's interesting because that wouldn't have been the first thing that I that I thought of. But I think that's why he mentioned it in that interview. Right. And then I got one other quote. Japed is a favorite of my books. I feel it is genu- it has genuine literary worth. The sentences are better built, the language itself is of a higher character, and here I made my departure from SF to straight novel writing, which I've never done, uh-huh. which I've done ever since. I'm determined to do a good, solid contemporary novel. Maybe someday I'll sell one of them. So, which I of th- course he only sold one of them. Right. He kept selling his science fiction, but uh, yeah, yeah. And 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 here's the thing that's interesting about it is that he feels like he turned a corner with Japed. I don't know. Do you feel like the quality level? Do you guys feel the quality level is that much better than the? There, last there was some read? awkward wording in it, but for the most part, I I felt it was a much better, much more solid novel than. I previous. think it was a lot more focused than the yeah. last two. Mm-hmm. Um, there was not an entire subplot loosely acting as a metaphor for the actual a plot right like there wasn't jones so keep in mind when we do cosmic puppets next month is yeah that, yeah that that book was actually i think written before this one so, it's cool puppets is like the twilight zone episode that pkd never wrote yeah it's cool so but just keep in mind that the trajectory of his writing that he felt like he was really moving forward with this one but that might not be reflected entirely in cosmic puppets but I think the next one that he actually wrote was Eye in the Sky. But we'll be getting to that in two months. But yeah, he was really fond of this book, and he felt like he really turned a corner. All right, next, what did the critics say? <laughs> oh, boy. Lauren Sutton sees Alan Purcell's Big Jape in the novel as a straight ripoff of Jonathan Swift's uh, modern proposal. Damon Knight... Modest. Sees- <laughs> Modest proposal, yeah, sorry. Damon Knight sees the novel as echoing Cyril Cornbluth and Fred Paul's The Space Merchants. Um, I don't really. Know, I don't yeah, know that I book. read Space Merchants many years ago. I think that might have been the humor that he saw in that. He also sees the effect of Alfred Bester's The Demolished Man on the plot. So they're right. doing a lot of he's taking from this and that, and he's taking from this and that. I've the only one of those that I The Demolished Man and Space Merchants I've read. Yeah, I don't. See the comparisons to the Demolished Man, but I definitely I, Space Merchants kind of has kind of a tongue in cheek thing, if I recall. But then again, it's been probably twenty five years since I read but either then, of those books. But so. then, Anthony, you thought there was no humor in this book, right? Well, I don't think it's that I, I I didn't think it was humorless. I just don't think the humor really resonated with me. Oh, okay. 
Because the critics do seem to not find it funny, and the, a lot of the reviews I saw said it it, it was serious. The, Whereas the things, I felt it the, was it was very funny. The things I laughed yeah, at I were not it was very funny too. The things I I laughed at were probably not intentional. For example, have you noticed an almost well almost like a, we've read a bunch of them already? But the, a thing I've noticed since I've read I've read ahead a little bit in the timeline since I was doing this before we started the podcast right. is that every couple, every married couple in these PKD books are terrible parents. They just have a robot nanny. It literally <laughs> takes care of every baby in these books, mm-hmm. um, which I found quite humorous. Right. Well, we'll talk about the different parts that I thought were, were funny when we get into the story. Um, there's a lot of articles online about uh, the man who japed. If you Google the man who japed and look for articles, there were some that I thought were pretty good. There's one on philipdick.com. If you go slash literary criticism, whatever, I, th- I thought... There's one called Digressions on the Man Who Japed, that I thought was a really good article. I didn't pull any quotes from it, but I definitely thought it was good enough to put the link here and maybe put that in the show notes on YouTube. Yeah. Or organizational discussions on the, about the podcast on the podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, there's also a website, uh, WordPress, Philip K. Dick Review uh, WordPress, and they had a review of the Man Who Japed that was excellent. It was like a three-page review. And I have this quote from that review. The man who japed. The man who japed to show how lies can be liberating or at least challenge those in power. This is a major power of the novel. Even the title shows that Dick thought the moral center of the novel is in the japery, not in the truth. Yeah, that's a good good point. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that was one. And Okja would... um, Oak... Oak Chew or whatever that the the online right. PKD zine in issue thirty seven has a article about the man who japed that I liked a lot. Those are some articles that you could look up about Again, the man who japed. Links in the description. Yeah, but let's let's get into this book. Anthony, can you read to me the back cover of your edition? I read this on the last episode. Yeah, do we and the, do it the again? one before that. <laughs> All right, I guess. Uh, so we no, we, let's read the other description. Read yours, David. I have a copy of three early novels of Philip K. Dick. It's a British edition that has The Man Who Jade, Vulcan's Hammer, and Dr. Futurity. 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 (laughs) Um, So it has all three in the one. Uh, The Man Who Japed, it says, Following a nuclear war, the moral reclamation government took over the world and forced its citizens to live by strictly puritanical rules all of which are reinforced through a constant barrage of propaganda. In this buttoned-up society, maybe all the revolution needs is one really great prank. That's it. It's pretty much the same as mine. Yeah, it's almost yeah. the same. Yeah, it's pretty I. It's pretty close. <laughs> Yay, Brits. Um, you got it right. Well, the, oh, the synopsis of this book so far is the one that's the most truthful True. to what's inside of the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking world Jones made. <laughs> Yeah, we can start getting into the story. So, yeah, I the right sto- what's that? Right on. Oh, okay. You guys, this was a serious cold open for me. Yeah. It was so boring. The opening of this book is very boring. Chapter and it's a, it's, Chapter 1 is very dull. It's a lot of world building and I I just can't imagine that this was the best place to start the story. Right. I absolutely agree with that. But yeah, there, there's some really interesting stuff there with, like, how the apartments are... How they function. How they yeah, function. Yeah, and it sets up Mrs. Birmingham, who later he comes under fire and at the block meeting. It it sets up a lot of stuff, but it it's so dry. dry. Yeah, yeah so, so one of the things about the apartments are, like, basically transformers that they... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, like, you, you push a button if you want the bedroom to come out, and it kind of shifts around, and then... Or, oh, it's kitchen time, so you push a button. And what I think is really interesting, if you think about it in the context of how this was supposed to be an analogy for communist China, is that one of the things about Maoist China is that they were trying to really, you know, make the living environments really bare because you weren't, you know, it was kind of like a, you know, it's part of the cultural revolution. They were going to take away all those things. It was going to be very utilitarian about, like, their living environments. And so I thought that was really interesting kind of in that context. Right, right? but it's also, it also reflects the 
commercials of the time, the GE ads and the things where they, the wave of the future and flying cars and, and the, uh, automatic ovens and all these different things that they were coming out with at that period or uh, talking about making. Yeah. And I didn't really take any notes or make any notes until like page 24. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot. Well, that was no, on. chapter two really got me into this book because we, we talk a lot about, or at least Anthony does about these boring sort of stuffed shirt characters. Chapter yeah, two. You know why I hate them so much? Because they remind me of me <laughs> and what I've no, but become. Chapter, chapter two, the <laughs> stuff shirt. I'm going to use that. Alan Purcell immediately breaks that mold when he fires his second in command. Yeah, it's really impulsive and it's shitty. It, it's not. He does it for a good reason, but you realize that this guy is not going to be your stuffed shirt, sort of run of the mill, go with the flow kind of person. He is actually going to take charge when he needs to. But does he? Yes, he does. Because I think as the story goes along, he kind of just falls back in line. He does not ever fall back in line. He takes the job at Telemedia. Well, that's because the guy he fired stole all of his stuff. As he should have. Oh, wow. Yeah, because firing people is wrong. No, firing people impulsively is wrong. It wasn't impulsive. It was totally impulsive. <laughs> Where do you get it's impulsive? He 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 makes one mistake and immediately because Sue Frost is in the room, he goes. He has fired. a huge personality flaw that makes him a yes man, and he doesn't need a yes man. What does he need? He needs people that think. Well, he fires him for not being a yes man. No, no, he fires him for being a yes man. Mm, David, hold on, I'm looking. Oh my god. Um. No, I didn't have any notes about that, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I did find why I was confused about what planet they <laughs> they were on. Oh, prior to the podcast, <laughs> David thought they were on a, a planet that was not Earth. Uh, Beetlejuice 4. And the reason why is there's a line where they he talks about his uh, Miss Birmingham having grown up on Beetlejuice 4. Oh. With rocks and goats. <laughs> <laughs> Beetlejuice is a very big star, so Beetlejuice 4 would have to be very far away from that star. But anyways, uh, no, I'm not sure about, I don't, I'm not sure what page the firing happened, but it's interesting that you guys are uh, in such disagreement on it. Um, right. I, I thought, I agree with Larry um, in the sense that I think that it showed a lot about his character, and that was a good thing for the story. Sure, I guess if you think being an impulsive asshole is good for the story. Well, yeah, you don't want your characters to be perfect, right? Well, sure, but we're talking about just in this instance. Right. Oh, maybe we should move on, because I don't want to argue about this for too long. <laughs> All right. The book really takes off when Alan Purcell, who is, he's offered the job of head of telemedia, which is the government-run basically television radio like news agency but he wakes up at home and has a memory of of cutting off the head of the statue of major jules strider is, is that, streeter? streeter streeter yeah dick and his names they're never <laughs> it's never smith Streeter, Ju Major Jewel Streeter, founder of the Moral Reclamation and guiding leader of the Revolution of 1985. And so there's like a little, he looks at the newspaper and sees that it happened. And then he basically has this memory that he did it. And then his wife says something, um, you know, like he's worried that they'll find out. And his wife says, why should they find out? They'll think it's some person who lost his lease, somebody who's been forced back to the colonies or a noose. And I thought that was interesting because it was it shows the importance of your lease, you know, and and, and yeah, like a rent control. Yeah. And that they'd be forced back to the colonies, unlike in the other books. Where oh, it's the first book so far where they don't fly away to some other stupid colony. Being at the colony is somewhere you don't want to be because you don't want to be forced there. But then his wife says to him, you're not sure why you did it, are you? And then he says I have, that he had a very clear desire, 
a fixed, overwhelming, and totally clear desire to get that statue once and for all. It took half a gallon of red paint and some skillful use of a power-driven saw. The saw is back in the agency shop minus a blade. I busted the blade. I haven't sawed in years. <laughs> so it's interesting that this all happened out of his control. Right? right. That was really interesting because that's how it really turns. I like how it he sees the newspaper headline. And so you may not have like laughed at that out loud, Anthony. Right. But I, I think it's kind of a funny scene. If you like, kind of, I, I don't know, for some weird reason I pictured in the role of Alan Purcell, for some reason I kept picturing Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. And so like, I had this kind of like very comical look in my head of him, like looking at the paper in a very physical way, like his eyes getting wide and like, yeah, you know, and then the memory occurring to him. You know, and so I think it would depend on if you were to make a movie of this, like how comedic you made the performance. But in my mind, I saw that as very comedic right. thing, you know, because if you're suddenly remembering that you cut the head off of a statue of a world leader, <laughs> but you didn't remember doing it, it would be kind of a goofy thing, especially seeing it in, in the newspaper. Yeah, I like that the the act itself is funny, you know, yeah. it, Picturing a guy trying to climb a statue and chop off its head with a saw that he's not used to using, and the uh, the the painting of it, and the just the general ridiculousness of not being able to remember it. it that it's not only funny, but it also adds mystery, central mystery to the whole story. Yeah, so I'm going to move on from that because I I do think that's a great scene, but. Um... The world building is really good in this book. Yeah. And I think it, of the first three books, it's it's definitely is the best world building because it has... It's very clear. Yes. There's very clear set things that, you know, I detailed in my notes. The other world, the block meetings, the Morarek, the um, Hokkaido. Like, these are all very, like, serious places in the book that are very well defined. And we can take them one at a time. But so the other world is a planet in a star system where patients are sent for exile. It's kind of like supposed to be like this like 50s suburbia idea like yeah. in in the world. It's the Eisenhower era. I yeah. mean that's And you're going to get sent to the, those places to be kind of reclaimed <laughs> or to be um, You're supposed to be cured there, but really they just keep people there. Right. And so that's one of the things about if you lose your lease, you're going to end up at the other world, mm -hmm. which is a really kind of funny concept. The Hokkaido. Well, the idea that you gain freedom by doing something wrong is just so backwards. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because it would be so terrible to have this freedom. But here on Earth, you don't have to worry about all those things because the more wreck keeps everybody in line and you don't have to worry about those things. Right. Yeah. And so, but there is one place on Earth where you can let it all loose. All hang out? <laughs> let it all hang out. Is the Hokkaido. Black's Beach. <laughs> Was there a reason he chose Hokkaido? I... That, that you're aware of? Well, maybe the, I don't know, the Japanese relationship with China, maybe? I don't know. Or the Japanese relation to the atom bomb? I don't know, but so Hokkaido is a place on Earth that's not subject to the Morarek. It's like a, a sanctuary for... Well, it's not quite a sanctuary because it's also heavily irradiated. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So he may have been thinking about Hiroshima there. Yeah, yeah, so... Potentially. Yeah. I don't know. It, it is the only real evidence of, of nuclear weapons, right? Right, and we know that this is supposed to be about Post-apocalyptic, kind of, post-nuclear war society. Was, was it Africa or China that kind of rose up with the nukes and kind of took people out? I, I, I don't remember. Yeah, it's, it's hard to recall, but it would make sense if it was China because um, China and Japan, not big fans of each other during no, this time. No, um, no, they are rarely fans of each other. Rarely fans of each other. If you've ever watched a Chinese movie, the bad guy is always the Japanese guy. Right. Always. Yeah, so Hokkaido, yeah, it's a really interesting part. And see, to me, that was also a funny part of the book. Was Oh, that was hilarious. Yeah, that you're going to this, it's like going to a rave in a post-nuclear wasteland, right, right. right? 
It's like, that's where we're going to party. Where they're constantly digging underground and searching around for past items. Right. And one of the most comical things for me was was the block parties. So... <laughs> Well, it's you, not, it's not I don't a know block if I, party. I don't, I don't know if I a found this meeting. funny. They're, they're block meetings. They're, they're, you, they're not, you know, hanging out and playing music in the street. Yeah, it's not the 90s. Yeah. Sorry, that was just my brain farting. Um, That's fine. Block meetings, the block meetings. So in this society, the most kind of important thing that you have is your lease and your place to live. In the Morrex society, like, that lease is everything. So all, because all land is owned by the state, which is obviously a very direct analogy for China, right? Yep. And so you can lose your your lease if you're morally unacceptable to the neighborhood, right? Right. So in these weekly meetings, they have reports on morally suspicious behavior. <laughs> and the building residents, it's kind of like the, the condo board in Frasier, <laughs> you know? Uh, I'm just yeah. thinking of Frasier. Any um, kind of housing association. Like really. a housing association. I know like Frasier is not the only place in the world where there's condo associations, <laughs> but that was just the first thing that came to my mind because he would, there's always funny episodes about that. So that was the first thing that came to my mind was all the times they did that in Frasier. But these block meetings, uh, Mrs. Birmingham kind of runs the ones that we see. She's yeah. like a nosy busybody. Just yeah. In everybody's business. She'd probably be played by Kathy Bates. Right. <laughs> ah, yeah, good casting. Or uh, Marissa Gay Harden would be a good person. Marsha. Good. Marsha Gay Harden, yeah. Right. Yeah, she'd be a good person uh, if you're going a little younger. But it's, and this was all modeled after, like, the Chinese Communist Party had this, like, they had these things called these accusation meetings where they did truth telling, where they like kind of expose people that you know where you could like basically rat out your neighbors for doing stuff that they didn't like. <laughs> and so, well, and this I, also comes from the the quote that I used for this episode is all about how uh, Phil K. Dick experienced this kind of telling all behavior when he was in the rehab center in Canada mm. and he talks, he, he realized how essentially evil it was that, that you would go to a place and just rat out people and yeah. have it be part of your, you know, part of your being a good citizen. But yeah, that, if you want to be a narc, right. But in this book, the narcs are little tiny metal creatures called juveniles, juveniles. called juveniles. What are, not but trying to I understand the name, but I know Dick didn't do this because he wasn't alive now. But I saw a lot of of uh, similarities between now and what Dick's writing in this book in this instance because everyone has us. a camera. Mm -hmm. Instead of juveniles, we have actual juveniles carrying around cameras and <laughs> pointing them everywhere all the time. Yeah, that is an extremely prescient uh, part of the book. Yeah, right. That's true for sure, and. Um, yeah, it's these things when we discuss it, when we discover we discover these things about the books that always make them like cooler than when I first read them, you know. <laughs> and we, but that's why we, we do have a this. bunch of signs too. Everywhere you go, you see signs that say, "If you see something, say something." In the movie theater, they say, "If something's, if someone's being weird, tell us about it." You know, mm -hmm. all these, mm -hmm. all these different rat out ideas in our society. Yeah, and you're society. giving control to people who may not be able to assess the situation. You know, right. like if you're just hanging out, barbecuing, well, minding your own right. business. I don't yeah. think, by the way, he... Or I you're selling water. You're a eight-year-old oh, girl selling water. That's right. So I don't think he had been to Canada, by the way, yet for the rehab. He I, I don't talked... He, he did. Oh, before Japed? He talks about it in the quote. I can't remember the quote exactly at the moment. Uh, okay, well, I didn't, uh, yeah, that's possible, but, um, so I want to read this part about what we were talking about, the, um, block meetings. Actually, he had been up, yeah, he had been to Canada. Yeah, I, I understand that he'd been to Canada, I just wasn't sure if he'd been to rehab yet, but, um, in Canada. Well, I'm not sure it was the rehab, it was some center he was in. The hell, are you talking about, the health resort isn't even really, a, well, I guess it's a, it's a rehabilitation center, but really it's just a way for them to figure out whether or not he's a fucking precog. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> right. That was ridiculous. Yeah, I have thoughts on the precog thing later. <laughs> um, someday he'll write a book where the word precog that, is not that, in there. That, and okay, auto I'm going to say that scene was pretty funny. 
Because I imagine the doctor just being frustrated going through all this montage <laughs> right. of, of failed precog tests. Is, that's pretty funny. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> it's like, okay, Anthony, let me move on to this boring part of the podcast. <laughs> Where I read stuff. So I, I like the voice that kind of announces the meeting says, these meetings operate on the idea that a man is morally responsible to his community. That's a good idea. But his community is also morally responsible to him. If it's going to ask him to come up and confess his sins, it's got to give him up something in return. It's got to give him its respect and support. It should realize that having a citizen like Mr. Purcell up here is a privilege. Mr. Purcell's life is devoted to our welfare and the improvement of our society. If he wants to drink three, gra- three glasses of wine once in his life and say one morally objectionable word, I think he should be allowed to do it. It's okay by me. So it's a guy speaking to the meeting. That's what it was. Right. Mr. Wade. Yeah. That, he was a fantastic small character, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. But his, I, uh, Go ahead. He has the – later on in the book, Mr. Wade plays a major role by not being present at one of these meetings. And he is paid handsomely for it. And it's a direct uh, reference to Judas. In fact, he, he calls himself – Judas for taking his new apartment over being at the meeting and speaking up for Mr. Purcell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good small character that adds a lot to the story. And he's devout. Yeah. He is totally devout in his, his belief of the system. So I did find a quote where he's talking about the juveniles, like that there's, there is certain spots where the juveniles are not allowed which is weird because I, but he, there's a line where one of the characters asks, are you worried that a juvenile might be hiding in my closet? <laughs> this is an interesting <laughs> line. Right. And he also mentions something on page, on page 44 of my edition. It says, we, that is the psych front left from the war. Strider, Strider was an, was a canny, was a canny person, unusual ability. So it's like, they're kind of implying that Strider kind of came to power because he was part of the psych front. Streeter. Streeter, yeah, part of the psych front, whatever the right. fuck the psych front is. Yeah, but, well, that was kind of. He doesn't go into detail on that, really. Yeah, and then, but then he also says something in here, and and this is on page forty five, and this kind of gets to what we were talking about earlier, and why I got confused on that is it does say again here that he met his wife in the colonies on Beetlejuice four, right? Yeah, on Bet four. That yeah. time it says Bet four. Yeah, so that's that's what I was confused about. So we forgive um, you. Yeah. One of the other things in the world building that's really cool is is all the talk about the age of waste. <laughs> right. And so the age of waste, kind of the book suggests that there's like this era that... Uh, that's our era. Yeah, our I ter- mean, his era he's yeah. talking about. Yeah, that this era almost destroyed humanity and it's kind of like... And it kind of led to like why they're living in these compact folding apartments with bare bones and... You know, right. obviously an analogy for communism, but why would they do that? And this on, is also a recurring theme of his is yeah. the degradation of life itself due to our excesses. Right. And so the age of waste really gets introduced in the scene where they visit a museum. <laughs> oh, I love the carousel of, of or what is it called? Um, the museum of past happiness or something. <laughs> yeah. The hub of the museum was its 20th century exhibit. <laughs> yeah, I don't see it, the name for it. I almost called it the Carousel of Progress. Yeah, which is a, a Disney ride, if you don't know. <laughs> but it's a it's almost exactly what Dick has in this in this story, except there's no you know nuclear war. Yeah, here's here's what you're talking about on page 60 of my edition. Visitors lined up at the circular railing and watched as the as life in the age of waste rotated by. <laughs> See, that <laughs> is exactly is what the carousel dude. of progress is. Yeah, this is very funny. And there's a giant sign that says how they lived. And then like one of the characters Ned, he, he's like, "Can I press the button?" Isn't that uh, a kid? Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. He just yeah. wants to slam that button and Make explosions happen. Right. And the ruins of Remind the... you of anyone, yeah. Anthony? Mm, maybe. <laughs> In the ruins of the cellar, the surviving... This is... Maybe a whole generation. <laughs> right. 
Michael Bay fans. <laughs> so there's this part on that same page where it says, in the ruins of the cellar, the surviving mannequins huddled over their pitiful possessions, a tank of decontaminated water, a dog that they were stewing, a radio, <laughs> medicines. Only three mannequins had survived, and they were haggard and ill. Their clothing in shreds, and their skins were seared with radiation burns. Over this hemisphere of the exhibit, a sign concluded, and died. <laughs> so how they lived and and died are, like, huge on this page. Right. Like, Dude, how are you not laughing at this shit? Like, I, I, this I especially I especially laugh because I am comparing it to a Disney ride. And right. it's like the anti Disney ride. And so the kid he has Alan has to explain to the kid that it's just an image being projected and the kid wants to press it again. <laughs> and he's like, I want to blow up the house. <laughs> and like uh, this is hilarious. But like the whole age of waste thing, like, is just such a huge theme in this part of the book, and I, yeah. I, I loved it. This is one of my favorite parts of the, of, of the book. And there's also, there's a line later on in the book where somebody says, you're not talking to a college radical from the age of waste. <laughs> I thought was, <laughs> you're just not talking to somebody from the age of waste. So I thought that was really good. So that was pretty awesome, too, but... You know, something I meant, like, we're going to have to come back to the block meetings in a little bit because, like, there's more that happened with that. But Well, why can't we talk about it now? Well, I guess yeah, we can. Yeah, David, let's do it. Yeah. So there was a line. Hit me with a block party. <laughs> with the block meetings. So later on in the book, there's another one where Alan's basically brought up again. And one, two of the lines that made me most laugh, there's, there's a line where... One of the one of the neighbors is like accusing Alan of this stuff and says, "Is it not true that all of this has been concealed from your wife? And in reality, your wife has never met this woman and could not possibly have any opinion of her except the normal opinion of a wife towards her husband's mistress." Yeah. And the next <laughs> sentence is just general pandemonium. Right. <laughs> Which reminded me of the man with two brains when <laughs> when uh, Steve Martin s- says to the guy, he's like, what are they saying in the crowd? And he's like, oh, they're just general murmur. Right. And then murmur, he says, murmur. he says, murmur all you like. And the crowd starts going, murmur, 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 murmur. 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 <laughs> right? <laughs> this general pandemonium line just cracked me up. Right. So I thought that was really funny. And then on that same page, one of the one of the characters says, any man who is capable of sexual activity during his first day of the job is an unusual man. Yeah. Which I thought was a really funny <laughs> line. Um, and so did the crowd. Yeah, they yeah, they laugh and there's scatter of applause. And like this this whole scene with the block meeting here, the second one, is freaking hilarious. But it also made me really mad. Yeah, because the, it's like the wh- voiceless accuser or whatever, the general accuser, whatever they call it. Yeah. You know, the just slandering constantly without stopping and without responding to Alan's, you know, questions. Yeah. the blo- And we never find out who that person is. Yeah. And then Mrs. Birmingham goes on to say, the block neighbors of Mr. AP regret that they are required to find Mr. AP to be an und- undesirable tenant. This is exceptionally unfortunate since Mr. AP has been an exemplary tenant in the housing unit for many years and his fa- and his family before him. Mr. AP, point in fact, was born in the apartment he now holds. Therefore, it is with deep reluctance that the council, speaking for Mr. AP's block neighbors, declares his lease to be void as of the sixth day of November 2114. So yeah, that could you imagine I, I, being put on trial like that in front of your whole housing community over something that's probably really not a big deal? Yeah, I yeah, would it's, it's go disgusting. insane. Yeah, but you know her voice was dripping with sarcasm when she said it, but they put it through the filter so it comes out even. Right. Well, and look, what was his crime? There's there's a line, and I think you brought it up earlier, Larry, that. You know, in a book that, that we found to be very, very funny, there's, you know, Gretchen, the character Gretchen says to him, like, oh, I, you do have something in your mind nobody else has, but it's not precognition. What is it? You have a sense of humor. Right. 
So I lot, laughed out loud at, <laughs> at that line. Yeah, it was very funny. Um, <laughs> right, because this that's what it all comes down to is like... This is a dead society. This is a dead society, and this guy having a sense of humor, going and taking the head off the statue, the, the sense of humor in this more wrecked society is a huge part of it. And that's why the book is... Well, listen, remember, the the only art this society has is through the packets. Right. And the packets are only there to support the society. So all the artists that could exist have to do that one thing. They have to be in marketing, which right. I think in itself, Dick was kind of poking fun at, that if you're... If you are an artist of any sort, you also have to be in marketing. Hmm. Well, yeah. And, and oh, yeah, because you have to be a part of the telemedia and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that that line, that's the crux of the novel right there is that 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 or that for me, that's the crux of the novel is that line where she says you have you're not precog. Yeah. You have a sense of humor. You have a sense of humor. So even though he wasn't a precog, PKD had to, apparently, he was being paid by the National Precog Society right. to <laughs> mention the term precog or precognition. We made it pretty far. I was actually thinking as I was reading it, are they never going to bring up precogs? Right. <laughs> and, but, but, but we got there, so check. Yeah, apparently he was getting paid by somebody, so... But that's the crux of the novel, that that line. I, I dog-eared, circled it, like everything when I read that line. I was yeah, like, that oh. is absolutely the whole point. The whole point is that the greatest rebellion in this society is just to have a sense of humor. Just to lighten up. Yeah, just to lighten <laughs> up is a, is a part of it. So I think, you know, if anybody were to take this seriously, you know, and we'll get to this later about the, doing a movie, it's a comedy. It, yeah. th- this book is a political sci-fi comedy, and I'm surprised, Anthony, you didn't laugh more because we. De- I definitely. I laughed quite a bit during a sci testing montage. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> I think the 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 block meetings, the whole thing, but but listen, I think the bottom line here is that, and this is what's cool about Philip K. Dick, and this is why it's awesome that we're doing this podcast is that some of these things I just didn't catch when I was first reading it. And the more you think about it and the more you look over it and read about it, these things come up and you start to see these themes and ideas. And there's like really cool social commentary going on. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think PKD is right. We're, you know, because I was thinking we'd probably be six or seven novels in before we started to see his powers for satire and his powers for social right reflecting society and but it's already it's already well into this book yeah right We're it there. definitely is i mean basically he's trying to tear down the government through comedy yeah yeah so yeah the man who japes um any like other closing thoughts before we talk about adaptation i uh well i really enjoyed the book so, yeah, I enjoyed this one too. I think I gave it three stars, but I might have to revise that up to four because I give it about three point five four Moric principles out of yeah. five. Well, we didn't. Talk- ah, <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. yeah, you beat me to it. We didn't. Uh, we didn't talk about uh, what is whatever the Japanese island where the, the two guys and oh, their hovel. Uh, what was it Coates? It's, uh, it, no, Coates is his alias when he goes to the health resort. Oh, yeah. yeah You're yeah. thinking of uh, Sugar Man and Gates. Yeah, Sugar Man Gates, and Gates. excuse me. I, I have a question for you. Yes, yes, sir. Do you believe that these two guys are homosexuals? Hmm. Hmm. I, I guess I didn't even consider it. Yeah, I, I just see that they're it. not part of the society. Right. And this is a, you know, a very religious, Calvinistic society where they would be shunned if they were. Is it kind and of, they they live in this dead space where together where they they just hunt for relics. I mean, it it, it could not be. It could be, but I just thought it was an interesting. I don't know how idea. I feel about him naming a character in that situation, Sugar Man, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it is nineteen fifty five when he wrote it. So right, but um, we also didn't talk about the uh, the. The pornographic oh, materials. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, there was a, a hilarious part. Again, another really funny part where right. he's going through and finding old books that were... Um, oh, yeah. I think <laughs> I wrote this down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> books like The Indefatigable Virgin, right. I, the Killer, <laughs> yeah, and Ulysses. And Ulysses. <laughs> but yeah. I thought that was great that the, he made that comparison of all these this pornographic uh, smut and, and then compared it to Ulysses as the same and thing. And Truman Capote. And, right. Um, yeah, there was a Saturday Evening Post, as mentioned here. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, that was a really funny part, too. And it was, like, interesting to see PKD writing, like, bad, like, kind of porn. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, erotica. But you also see that he was a huge fan of Joyce. Yeah. Yeah, which is cool. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that part too too deeply. But yeah, that that was that was an interesting and funny part. And there's also like an interesting part where they talk about how they disseminate the news to the colonies. Mm-hmm. Which is really funny. Glebe Glebe, which is a funny name, <laughs> scribbled a few words. We've already mailed out duplicate films to the colonies. The discussion right. has been written up and will be printed in full in Tuesday morning's newspapers. Plus comments, pro and con. Late night news programs will give resumes. We had the press run off paper bound copies to be sold in commissaries at magazine slots. <laughs> at the slots, um, which was interesting. And then there were some. There was a heat beam weapon. There was some kind of <laughs> that was yeah. hilarious. The way he got off the uh, off that other planet. Yeah, and so here there's a surprising lack of wackadoo science in this one. Well, except right? for all those precog tests, or the or um, one of the things, this actually I really like the scenes that are kind of surreal where they're trying to recall his memory. Yeah, I thought those were interesting, but the right. science to do that's probably pretty wackadoo because it all they say <laughs> all they say are. I put a bunch of hickey doos here and there, and it's a thing. <laughs> it was wackadoo psychology. Yeah, basically. And it was kind of wackadoo that they went from like bet four to Earth between like Tuesday and Sunday. <laughs> yeah, it took is, four days. Four yeah, it took four days. So that is kind of wackadoo science. So, <laughs> well, it's, but it's not explained. So, yeah. That's... But what, uh, I want to talk about the end because I had a real problem with the the end, the swift part. Yeah, see, okay. I haven't... The final read, jape. Yeah, I haven't read Modest Proposal, so, to be honest with you, so... Well, it's, it, basically, it, it, it's just about how the English should eat Irish people so that they're not starving. That's what Bam. happens in the Modest Proposal. Yeah. Right. It's Modest Proposal. Oh, you mean the ending of the... Oh, the ending of this book is the same ending. Yeah. Right. Well, so, and, it, and he got called out on it. He did get called out on it. And yeah. I, I didn't know he had gotten called out on it till after I read the book, but the uh, it just seems so obvious, right? You know, it it made me like the book less, and I enjoyed it a lot up to that point, yeah. up to the final jape, and then that. So, I have how to many it, japes would you give it? I have to give it three <laughs> three japes. How many more ec principles? <laughs> uh, three more ec principles, and that's it. I'm going to give it four out of five japes. I'll give it, uh, yeah, four. Four out of five japes because I think, like, just the, the, the themes that it brings up and, like, the way it mirrors uh, communist China is one thing that's really cool, levels of which the book works, and then the level of which the humor worked. I laughed a lot during this book. Right. I found so many parallels to today's society. Well, and look, it's the kind of humor that not everybody's going to find funny, you know, like the whole scene. It's the nature of humor, though. Well, right. And it's like that scene in Scanner Darkly that's freaking hilarious with the guy freaking out with the bugs on him. Right. (laughs) That, like, when I saw Scanner Darkly in the theater, the theater was full of people and there were three of us laughing our asses (laughs) off at that scene. Yeah, I had the same experience. Right. And I, so I don't think the humor in this will work for everyone, but I think if you're a, you're a dickhead already. I think the humor is going to work for you. True. Yeah, I, I think, and I think it's a cool little departure from the first two books we read. Yeah. So, on to adaptation. We're almost done. Bum, bum, bum. Who wants to go first, and how they would turn the man who japed into a film, and who they would have directed? 
Any star? I think you should probably go first. Because I... Way to volunteer someone else. You're welcome. I think. I voluntold him. <laughs> yeah. I think you've thought about this, but I haven't, is what you're trying to say. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I have not thought about this one as deeply as I had some of the other ones, um, because I don't necessarily think it would make a great movie. <laughs> um, right. It could. Um, like I said... But like you said, it would have to concentrate on the comedy. Right. And my first thought was somebody who is not young anymore, which was Dick Van Dyke, so you couldn't have him star in it. Yeah, I would want to get a director who did comedy but had a visual style. Mm -hmm. You know... I think we just had the problem with Lord and Miller trying to make a science fiction movie and kind of going overboard on the comedy. So it's definitely going to be kind of a weird thing. But I like when some of the comedians who are really funny try to make a serious movie mm -hmm. somewhat or kind of balance it. And I'm thinking of like, like, you know, when Will Ferrell did that movie where he was the guy who wasn't real. Right. You know, something like yeah. that. I would like to see somebody who has comedy chops play Alan Purcell straight. So maybe like, kind of like how Adam Sandler did Punch Drunk Love, right? Right. Something like that. You and know, I, like Robin Williams and Jim Carrey and yeah, actually, very Jim, funny. Jim Carrey would be an interesting choice, but I, I'm i thinking more Will Ferrell <laughs> in the lead That's role. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah hmm. As Alan Parcel, but playing it straight. Um, it's Purcell. Purcell, yeah. <laughs> Which I should know because one of the guitar players in one of my favorite bands name is Purcell. But <laughs> Purcell from Youth of Today. Shout out to Youth of Today. But, uh, and Judge. Yeah, Alan Parcel, I think, played by... <laughs> <laughs> wow. You did it again. What? Purcell. Purcell. <laughs> Purcell. Purcell, I know. Well... He was poor. Well, anyways. <laughs> so I don't know on director so much. Uh, I don't know a lot of comedy directors so I, well. Um, I honestly would think the Fairley Brothers. Whoa, that's too comedy, I think. No. I think they would make a great movie out of it. Who who did the uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind? The Michael Gondry? Uh, that was Gondry. Gondry? Gondry. Yep. Yeah. He, you know Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. That would be good. Michael Gondry starring Will Ferrell. <laughs> I don't think that would work at all. But or well, he worked with Jim Carrey really well, so why not Jim? Yeah, Carrey? and Eternal Sunshine, which was a, a brilliant script. But yeah. the um, but his, I don't think his visual style would work in this yeah, kind of button down world. I know we talked about Terry Gilliam last time for the for the World Jones made, but that wouldn't be too terrible either. Or um, oh, you know, I got it, I got it, guys. Well, I got it, Edgar Wright. Yeah, no, I can yeah, see I that. I can see that. With Simon yeah. Pegg. Put them back together. Put the band back together. Simon right? Pegg is, is yeah. Purcell. I can see uh, that. Yeah. yeah. That would be cool. And have it kind of a British, and, and go straight British accents, too. Right. Yeah. That, ah, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> so, yeah. Anybody else have any other yeah, ideas? Yeah, he needs to bounce back from Baby Driver. I like Baby Driver. Yeah, I like yeah, I liked Baby really? Driver, too. Yeah. yeah. What's wrong with Baby Driver? Oh, I don't Aside know. Aside from the don't say it, over the top acting, okay. the terrible ending. I don't uh, agree with any of that, but um, well, that's because you're stupid. It got <laughs> it got a little. <laughs> Baby Driver got a little old for me after a little while. Like I thought it could have been a little shorter, but you know, a lot of one note. Jamie Fox was ridiculous. Let's not talk about Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey was beyond ridiculous. Well, yeah. he's never... ever changing character. All right, yeah. So, um, do you do you have any other choices, or are we just going to go with Edgar Wright? So, now, since we started talking, and no, I don't know if it's a collective thing, I'm still going with the Fairley Brothers. <laughs> I actually, dude, explain to me why the Fairley Brothers. Great, I guess I don't choice. get a turn. Go on. No, you get a turn, but first he tells me why the Fairley Brothers. Yeah, is, we'll tell is, you when it's your turn. Just the like Fairley Brothers are too David. far in the <laughs> fair. <laughs> the Fairley Brothers are too far in the comedic side to me. Like how like look look at the movies that they made like something about Mary how shall or whatever Kingpin, uh, Kingpin is an kind of still holds up a little bit. I like. That. Did you watch it recently? Yeah, I did. Dumb and Dumber. I do. I do movie. enjoy that movie. The first one, Dumb and yeah, Dumber holds up. Dumb and Dumber. Something about Mary is pretty funny. 
But it's got moments. I haven't seen it since it was in But theaters. I don't see anything in their visual style that they could handle like the effects or What like, what that's what I'm saying. There is no real visual effects here. What? It takes place in 2114. Yeah, in a basically a concrete nuclear. Yeah, I guess. Very you know. flat. Yeah. Right, there's a, a central park with a statue. Yeah, but it's going to take some 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 physical effects to make the apartments shift. But if you're making a comedy, I yeah. think they would work well with the people, with the All cast. Right. Let's put it this way. I would see a Fairly Brothers version of this. However, I think Edgar Wright would be better. Fairly Brothers, the man who japed. That would be so weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Edgar Wright makes a little bit more sense. But to you. To me. I think Edgar Wright makes more sense to me, too, in the sense of that I could see... He, he does a really good job with visual style. I don't know if you guys saw Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, but I thought it was no, great. No, and never heard of, of it. What? <laughs> you, know, you, you mess with me, Larry. Um, I actually want to say, now that we've been talking about it... Who you got, Anthony? Who I'm going to go with... Um, give me one second. I had it, and then I didn't have it. And me no have it no more. But why don't we go with uh, Jonathan Dayton? Who's that? He directed Little Miss Sunshine. Oh. Oh. And um, I like that movie a lot. And um, maybe Steve Carell is Alan Purcell. Ooh, that's good casting. Yeah. Yep. So that would be mine. And then then maybe if I can steal, Any of the yeah, former- I'm gonna steal. I'm gonna steal actors from Little Miss Sunshine too, because I think maybe uh, <laughs> Alan Arkin could do a good uh, Mavis, right? A good tired, overworked, which is another media character man. I really liked. And you thought Kathy Bates is Miss Birmingham, yeah? And I said uh, Mar- Marissa, Marsha, Mar- Marsha Gay Harden, Gay Harden. Yeah. So yeah. that would be my pick. Um, um, oh, you know who would have been a good Purcell, uh, Par- Purcell in his day is. Um, Tim Robbins, he's too old now, I think. But Tim Robbins would have been good. Mm-hmm. Oh, and you know what? Oh, yeah, Tim Robbins would be. You know what movie has a good tone to match the tone that I see with this one? What? It would be The Hudsucker Proxy by the Coen Brothers. Right. Oh, a Coen Brothers <laughs> man who japed. That Ooh. might be neat. That'd be neat. Yeah. They would never do it. With, uh, with, um, uh, they, they might. They might. They've I guess they did things. make true With John Turturro, Turturro as Alan Purcell. <laughs> John Turturro. <laughs> That, yeah, I could see uh, the man who japed by the Coen brothers. Right. Yeah, because the Hudsucker Proxy is the, like the the level of humor that I see. Yeah, yeah. I see it as. It's very much. That's a very, very underrated similar. Coen brothers movie, too. I, I agree. The Hudsucker Proxy. I'm going to have to watch the Hudsucker Proxy again. Um, and like so, kind of some of the humor, like the scene where the guy gets up on the table and very quietly just leans back and forth and then runs out the window and it's like that's the kind of humor that i could see really translating well to the man who japed it's right it's like not really direct but any one of the uh daily show correspondents yeah. i think the former ones like corell would be a good one yeah well, yeah corell or um i could see stephen colbert and john stewart and all those like kind of those old fake talking heads being in it. even rob cordry could probably be in it right yeah yeah, friend of the flop house, Rob yeah. Gordon. Yeah. Oh man, I want Elliot Kalin to be in the man who japed now. <laughs> <laughs> He'll read the audio book. Oh, that would be great. All right, what I, else we got? Um, um, no, that's it. I think we're, we've we've come to the close of our episode. What are we reading uh, for next time, David? Uh, we are reading the Cosmic Puppets. Woo, woo. Cosmic Puppets, which Anthony- also has a short-ish story connected to it, which we'll have to look into. Oh well, no! It started as a short story and then was revised yeah, and expanded. The, yeah, the, so we're going to read something of the shadow or something. Glass of darkness. of darkness. Glass of darkness. Yeah, which was the title it was originally published in a magazine under. So we'll probably cover that as yeah. well. Because you're you're the MVP, uh, Larry, <laughs> and you're going to get the magazine for us. Yes. Yep. MVP. MVP. Larry. But before we do uh, the cosmic puppets, or is it just cosmic puppets? Cosmic Puppets. Okay. We have a movie coming up, huh? Yeah, we're going to do Screamers. Fuck Screamers. Yeah. Another uh, great short story, too. Yeah. Second so, variety. 
Yeah, so we're going to do short story, second variety, and then watch Screamers, and that's going to be a scream. (laughs) Get off my podcast. Get the fuck out of here. Get off my podcast. Oh, shit. Oh, it (laughs) is time to go. So don't forget, you can find us on social media at (laughs) socialmedia.com. www.socialmedia.com. I wasn't expecting that. That was great. Uh, yeah, you can find us on Twitter at Dickheads Pod. You can find us at that on most platforms, Instagram. Facebook, I think, right? We have a Facebook yep. page. Yeah, we have a Facebook um, page. You can find me on most social media as Anthony T 697 I'm more active on Instagram and Twitter than Facebook. Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at D. Agronoff author. That's A G R A N O F F author. Um, but you know, you can find all of our links on from I think from our profile on the Dickheads Twitter. Yeah. So yeah, and you so, can find me mostly. Just look for Langhorn J Tweed. Yeah, and, and I should pop up somewhere. Yeah, pop us questions or whatever. We're not getting a ton of feedback <laughs> from people. We know people are listening. We but, definitely want more. Yeah. Yeah, if you so, think there's stuff you want us to cut back on, do more of. If you want me to shut up or, you know, whatever. Every just, day I want, want that. You're if such you a want, liar. If you want <laughs> Anthony to stop looking at his phone. <laughs> yeah, this they'll never know. Unless they watch that Well, they YouTube will now. <laughs> yeah, we've got, you know, we got a lot to cover. But we're going to also do some bonus episodes from time to time and we're going to try to find cool exciting ways to do interviews that will do interesting stuff with more of the dick like things and, and investigate the people that are influenced by Philip K. Dick so yep. yeah so thanks for joining us on the Manu J. oh wait and if you have dick like suggestions for us oh yeah that would be great hit yeah. us up we, we definitely could do a much better job of being interactive with people on the interwebs yeah and yeah. in general, really, for me. No, I'm good not no. doing that in real life. <laughs> but <laughs> no, Yeah, no. I'm, I'll am i tell you what. I just finished reading The Long Tomorrow by Lee Brackett, which is a – she was the first do si do with, um, with PKD. And I tried to find the book that was in do si do with Solar Lottery. I couldn't find it, so I read The Long Tomorrow, which is a post-nuclear Lee Brackett novel. She went on to write the first screenplay for Empire Strikes Empire. Back. Yeah. I'm still making my way through The Water Knife by Paolo Bacchigalupi. I'm probably never going to finish it. <laughs> well, hey, a dick-related thing. But the book, I'm flying to Indiana tomorrow to visit my family, and my air, my airplane read is going to be the second book of Carrie Vaughn's Bannerless oh, excellent. series, which she sent me an ARC copy of the book that comes out July 17th. I'll probably be reposting the interview that we did with her with my review when it comes out. Cool. Here in a couple days, so I'm I'm hoping to toast off that whole book by the time I get land in Indiana. So, so yeah, uh, see you later, tickets. Yeah, all right. Well, this is slowly devolved into <laughs> madness. I'm Anthony Trevino. I'm David Agronoff. I'm Langhorn. Jay Tweed. Tweed. Keep it paranoid, America. Stay paranoid. And, and everyone else, Always. not just America. I'm sorry, world. Keep it paranoid, world, <laughs> and all our other colonists and on different planets. Beetlejuice Wait, 4. So Holy now. shit. I don't know anymore. Good night. <laughs> See you later, Beetlejuice 4. <laughs>